Turn in your Bibles to Mark's Gospel. We're going back into the Gospel of Mark. We took a little, a little deviation from that uh, for a couple of reasons. My, my two knee surgeries, uh, now that we're getting those behind us a little more, we're getting back into the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 42 to 50. Now, before I read this, I want to say to you that if you have the English Standard Version or, or another version, you may see that there are some verses that were, were not there. I'll kind of explain why that is so. Uh, I read from the English Standard Version. I have chosen to put those verses back where they are in other versions. There's a, there's a debate about, uh, about which texts showed what materials. So don't be alarmed if, or confused uh, by that. Find Mark chapter 9, verses 42 to 50. If you don't have your Bible with you, we've got the, the text. We'll have the text on the screen for you. As we think about this, this subject of, of don't be a stumbling block. Don't be a stumbling block. Let's stand together and ask you just to follow along as I read uh, this uh, very pointed uh, passage. Some of, the, some of the most earnest aggressive, intense words from the mouth of Jesus that we have in all the Gospels. Beginning in verse 42, Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. And these words need to sink into our hearts today because the scripture teaches us that temptation will come. We just read it together in Luke 17. But woe to the one from whom temptation to sin comes. Thank you. Be seated. If you'll remember when we were last, we were actually last in the Gospel of Mark in October, October 20, uh, 25th, the passage previous to this Jesus is answering the idea, the question about what is greatness. And he asserts that greatness is found in humbling oneself and esteeming a child for the sake of Jesus. He actually takes a child and sets him in the midst. Now, with that short response to the question what is who is great he turns his attention to the seriousness of being a stumbling block to others and to yourself now I want to separate something Paul does some writings in Corinthians about uh, Christian liberty and, and what's allowable in Christian liberty and how we need to show deference to others he for example he says uh, at one point if it offends my brothers to eat meat, I'll not eat meat. And he's talking about meat sacrificed to idols and all that. We're not, we're not talking about Christian liberty today. This is another discussion. It is about temptation, tempting someone to sin. In fact, Jesus turns this immediately from tempting someone to sin, one of these little ones who believe in me, to tempting yourself to sin. And so the temptation to sin... And I want to remind you what Martin Luther said. Martin Luther said, sometimes we cannot avoid areas where, where sin is there and tempts us. 
We can always we can always resist the temptation. He, remember, he used the example: you can't you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. And that's how he makes the distinction. Jesus presses in this passage, though, uh, that rather than being someone who causes destruction and despair and decay, Jesus challenges his disciples when you get to the end of the passage to take on the preservative properties of salt. So let's look at this. I want to see it under, under four headings today, briefly. First, the seriousness of causing someone to sin. Secondly, the seriousness of yielding to the temptation to sin. Third, the sobering inevitability of affliction and persecution. And fourth, salt as an image of grace. Now, this passage in Mark's Gospel has its parallel in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 18, uh, verse 6 and following. And in Luke 17, of course, as we read earlier. And also there, there are portions of this in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. I point that out to say that when three of the four Gospel accounts recognize this and when Jesus spoke to the issue more than one time uh, within the Gospel of Matthew it is we need to pay serious attention to this today the seriousness then of causing someone to sin he says whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin he's talking about there a young believer an immature believer it's not so much chronological age. You could be a full-grown adult and come to faith in Christ and you would be, you'd be a young believer at that point. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, and, and, and while sin is the word that is used there, it is the Greek word uh, for... We would, we would hear uh, uh, in that uh, to scandalize. It's actually a term that talks about setting a trap and springing a trap on a bird. Whoever causes one of these little, an immature believer to be ensnared, what's the value he places on an immature believer? It'd be better for him, for that one who is the cause of this, if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Linda Hare found an excellent image for our bulletin cover. It is the millstone. It is the large stone that would be pulled by a beast to grind the grain. And if you've got your bulletin and you look at that, you notice that there's an opening in the middle of it where, where uh, wood would go through to, to use it, to, it's a fulcrum to move it around. And what Jesus is saying here is that we would, it would be better for us on the day before we would cause a young believer to be ensnared, to trip them up, to, to, to sin against them, to cause them to stumble. It would be better that one of these things be placed over our necks and us thrown into the sea to be drowned at the bottom of the sea. Because you can, you can clearly see this graphic here. You, if one of these is strapped onto you, you're not coming back up for air. That's serious. That's serious. It would be better. So Jesus looks upon the church. Because the, that's what he's talking about here. It's life in the church. He's implying that a, another believer, he says whoever, it could take in anybody, but the implication is that another believer would act in such a way, speak in such a way, so as to scandalize a young believer. I, I want to say to you that uh, 
that when, when young believers, whether they're, whether they're adults newly come to faith in Christ or whether they're children who come to faith in Christ growing up, for them to see controversy in the church, for them to hear adults speak in, in untoward ways is serious. And Jesus doesn't take it lightly. I can't tell you over the years now, it's now, now 40 plus years of ministry, how many times I've talked to people, adults and young people, who say, I don't want anything to do with church. I said, why? Well, and they, they tell some tragic story about some church business meeting or some, some situation of this or that and the other and, and somebody that they maybe had, had previously looked up to as a mature believer had, had an outburst, uh, had a, uh, just unkind, manifesting an attitude that is contrary to the gospel. Because Jesus knows that that we are to be a place the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be the safest place on earth. For those who are, who are seeking the Lord, who have who, who not yet come to know Christ, for those who are, who are newly born again, who are growing, you wouldn't think well of a nursery by the way, let me say our, our nursery is, is growing. We thank the Lord for that. We've got, we've got some twins in there this morning for the first time. It's great to have uh, the Munsons back with us and bringing William and Gage with you this morning for the first time. The nursery's growing with little ones. And you would not think well of a nursery where there was chaos. If, if, you, if you had your child in one of our nurseries and you walked in and, and one of our nursery workers was just unloading on either the uh, little toddler or, or another worker or just you wouldn't think boy this is a wonderfully safe place for me to keep the children you wouldn't think that you say I'm getting my kids and getting out of here quick as I can well this is the picture that Jesus wants us to because he uses one of these little ones who believes in me and, and it ought to make all of us stop because here's, here's the reality. There are probably very few of us in here that could say, well, tell you what, I've, I've never done or said anything that could be construed as a, being a stumbling block. Gosh, I have. I have. Many of you have. We can thank God for His grace that He didn't send somebody with a millstone to take care of us. Jesus says it's serious. We ought, to, we ought to commit and pledge to one another in the sight of God. Dear God, help me by Your Spirit that, that my actions, my words would not be the occasion of a young growing believer someone new in Christ to, to stumble to be scandalized to, to themselves be brought into a snare by my words, my actions my influence you see Earlier in Mark 9, 37, I mentioned a while ago, he had said, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. He's talking about greatness here. Whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. You. To receive is to take into your care. To value. You value a child. If my wife were standing here, she would say, do you value the children in this ministry? 
that God's given us. Then we need you to serve. We need you to show them you value them by spending time with them to love them so their parents can study the word in Sunday school and worship together. And if you value the little, little ones, then you receive Jesus. He says, you, you, you value me and you value God. You value the one who sent me. You value Yahweh. And so we have this seriousness. We need to commit to one another in the sight of God. Lord, I do not, perhaps I have been in the past and I can think, Lord, I do not, going forward, want to be an occasion for some young believer to be scandalized, to be ensnared, to grow up because of my action at some point say, I don't want anything to do with church. You know people like that. You know adults like that to this day who saw professing Christians that they once had esteemed act like anything but a Christian and they say, this, what, is, what is there to this then? Second thing to look at though, he turns it, it's not just what, what is done to others, it's what you do to yourself. The seriousness of yielding to the temptation to sin. Now notice, there's a difference in, in temptation and actual sinning and Jesus focuses in on this. If your hand, and by the way, these, these powerful images are not to be taken literally in terms of a person cutting off his hand so that he doesn't steal. It's, it is powerful imagery. It's like Jesus saying, unless you hate your father and your mother, you can't be my disciple. It's, 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 it's imagery pushed to the limit to say, this is how seriously I, the Lord, take this. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. If, if you give yourself license to lay hold of sin, then you're damning yourself. And I said to my children growing up, and I say it to myself regularly, the worst thing that can happen to you and to me is to get away with sin. What do you mean by that? I mean that Christians who battle with remaining sin, when you sin, what happens? The Holy Spirit takes hold of you, rebukes you, reprimands you, When you sin, the scripture says you grieve the Holy Spirit who indwells you and he in turn grieves the one sinning. We should never be able to get away with sin. Because the day we start getting away with sin is the day that we, we are making our path to hell. And he goes through this here. Your hand causes you to sin. Cut it off. Your foot causes you to sin. Cut it off. Your eye causes you to sin. Pluck it out. The psalmist says, I made a covenant with my eyes that I will not look upon any unholy thing. The Puritan said, God has been merciful to give us shades for our eyes so that we don't, we're not forced to look on anything that is wrong. And the shades, of course, are the eyelids to drop the eyelids over. it. A hand. What we do. The feet, where we go. The eyes, what we gaze upon. In other words, our, our bodily parts that can be used to lead us unto righteousness. As the psalmist said in Psalm 23, you, you lead me in the wagon tracks of your righteousness for your namesake. Rather than to stray off of that and to pursue sin. That's how, that's how seriously Jesus takes this. He's basically saying to, for a Christian, and if you read 1 John, 1 John says you cannot go on sinning. And what he means by that is you cannot go on sinning successfully. 
It is always, it's always comes back to you in grief. If God dwells in you, we're to put to death sin. We're to mortify. That's the mortify the deeds of our body. Put an axe to the root of sin. Trace it back to what it is. And and very often, dear people, when we're not having the upper hand with sin, it's because we're neglecting some of the means of grace, of prayer, reading of the word, fellowship with believers, gathering for worship, uh, sharing the gospel. There are several means of grace that, we, that were given to us to employ that we're why we might battle sin and grow in grace. And we're not getting the upper hand with sin. John Owen, the Puritan, said, either... Either you are killing sin or sin is killing you. There's no middle ground. There's no neutral position. And in the ESV, this, rep this repeated phrase, where the worm does not die and fire is not quenched, is saved for the 48th verse from the studies of the various texts available. Some of the other texts see it as a rep repetition of, of Jesus just reminding you, just remember, what is hell? You hear some of the craziest things about what hell is, you know? Where people get these ideas just astonishes me. But here's what Jesus says hell is. Where the worm does not die, the, the, the cankerous worm that consumes decaying flesh, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, I don't want to be uh, unpleasant. But you can find an animal on the side of the road being consumed uh, by maggots and come back by sometime later and it's all gone. Except, except the bones maybe and some, some hair maybe. You can watch something burn, and in, in, in a matter of a little time, it turns to ashes. Jesus says, hell is a place so hellacious that the normal consequences don't, don't apply. That the worm consumes for eternity, and the fire consumes for eternity. That's hell. And no one in their right mind wants to go to hell. In fact, it's interesting that even people who live like hell, when they die, folks want to assure one another that that person's in heaven. I think about some of these famous people who, who lived a life of, of total debauchery. And they're having a great time in heaven right now. They're probably the, they're probably the main event. In the, and I'm thinking... You know nothing. You know nothing of what you speak. Because the main event in heaven is Jesus. And anyone who thinks that they would upstage him will spend an eternity apart from him in hell. The seriousness of yielding to temptation to sin. Fight it, brothers and sisters. Battle it. Cry out to God. Use the means of grace, the, the Word of God which is designed. The psalmist said, Your Word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against You. Your Word is a, a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The means of prayer. You know, you, you take the Word in and you memorize it and... and as you hide it in your heart and it becomes the matrix for your, for your thought process and when the enemy of your soul comes to assault you, there's, there is there a bulwark developed called the Word of God who, who repels that. Paul talks about it in Ephesians 6, the shield of faith. Faith in Christ, trusting Him alone. Believing that, that Jesus is the very best of life for you. More than all in you, I find. 
Paul says the shield of faith with which we will resist the fiery darts of the evil one. But that shield of faith has to be lifted. It has to be active. It has to be proactive. It has to be focused on Christ. And you cry out to God. Deliver me, Lord. Do not lead me to temptation. Deliver me from evil. Because Jesus takes this very seriously. And see, when we trifle with sin and play with sin, we are playing with fire. So, put to death the deeds of your body. That's the message there, very clearly. Put to death the temptations. Flee youthful lust which war against the soul. Now he, he shifts here. It's really interesting. Having, having given the warning about causing someone, a, a young believer, to stumble, to be ensnared, allowing yourself to be ensnared. He talks about this, this inevitability of affliction and persecution. So he's talking to believers here. Look at verse 49. It's, it's, what he's done is he has shifted the emphasis to where he's going and he's going to use salt in two different ways it's fascinating he says for everyone will be salted with fire in other words live in such a way that when persecution comes when the fire of persecution comes that you're you're convinced that that's the only fire you'll ever face is the fire of trouble. That will, that when that fire comes to the believer, it, it, it consumes the draught in us. It, it burns away the stuff that doesn't need to be a part. Persecution purifies, folks. So he's using two different kinds of fires. The fire of persecution, which purifies the believer. Let me tell you what the danger of some Christians is. When they're persecuted, when difficult providences come, you know what, you know what the temptation is to some believers? Is to turn to some sinful lust. The temptation to say, well, I didn't need this. And then to, to go and think to have your mind, your conscience salved on those things that are forbidden to us. So he talks about here that Every believer, Peter said, he who will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. I've told you before that word trouble is the Greek word thalipsis. In this world you will be squeezed. Be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And so the fire of persecution purifies. The eternal fire simply consumes and terrorizes. And he uses this here as a, as a sort of a shifting verse to talk about salt as an image of grace. In other words, rather than being someone who, who speaks in such a way, acts in such a way, carries on with no regard for the consequences of you know, the, the person, the, the ready, ready, shoot, aim person... That's harmful, he says, to young believers, that conduct. He says, rather than that, which would put you in a category that it would be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and drowned in the sea than to live long enough to be, have the opportunity to do that to a young believer. Rather than that, he says, look what he says about salt, verse 50. Salt is good. Well, he's just talking about everyone will be salted with fire. Persecution is good. I remind you, Samuel Lamb told me that I, when I was in China years ago. We met with Samuel Lamb. He, he's, he's passed away now. But he talked about the times he was imprisoned by the Chinese government. He said, before I went to prison, there were this many people gathering for worship. I come out of prison, there's a larger people, larger number of people gathering for worship. And he finally said, he did this two or three times, and he said, well, persecution is good for the church. I thought, wow, that is a message that people in America will have a hard time wrapping their minds around. Persecution is good for the church. See. It purifies and grows the church. 
So salt is good. But if the salt has lost its saltiness, now think about what he's talking about here, the person who, who causes someone to stumble. We're, we're salt of the earth. We're the light of the world, Jesus says. What does salt do? Salt preserves. Now, brothers and sisters, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that, that we're living in a society that is decaying at, at a rapid pace, an increasingly rapid pace. Our choices, it looks like, for president are going to be arsenic and cyanide. We're going to be salt. We're to be the spiritual paramedics when the Holocaust of God's judgment falls upon this country. We've been being judged by God in recent years. And one thing we cannot afford to do as believers is to be salt whose saltiness has gone. How do you make that salty again? What's he talking about there? He says you, you, can, you can ruin your reputation and your witness and how does it ever come back to full strength again? You can still witness. Don't let the devil stop you from that. But how do you want to be known? Oh, so and so, yeah. Uh, he liked a good argument. Well, so and so. Boy, he was. She was a sweet saint. Always felt encouraged when I walked away from him. He's talking about your witness, your reputation. How do you, how do you lose your saltiness? By, by becoming what he's warned you not to become in the earlier verses in this, in this passage here. Becoming a stumbling block. Being a stumbling block takes away the saltiness. And then he says in the second place, have salt in yourselves. In other words, so live for Christ and love Christ. And serve Christ. And worship Christ. That the saltiness is coming just from the overflow. The inside. Now, would you agree with me that you can meet, meet with some people and you can tell they've been with Jesus? Can you believe that? You can. You can tell they've spent some sweet time with the Lord. Have salt in yourselves, he says. Be sure that you're, you're employing the means of grace that's keeping the salt mine of grace filled in your life. And then he says, finally, be at peace with one another. Now, what, he's gone in this passage from, from causing turmoil, being a stumbling block, to being a peacemaker. You see, it's, it's the peacemakers who are called sons of God. We've, we've looked at this in different angles in the past here. Peacemaker or peacebreaker. You see, a person who is causing one of these little ones to stumble is a peacebreaker. It's, it's breaking the peace. It's breaking covenant, really and truly. When you read through our covenant, what we covenant to do with one another, and to be to one another, to, to walk together in brotherly love. Well, brothers and sisters, I don't, I don't have the language to press upon you how seriously... Jesus Christ takes this matter of being a stumbling block. But I, I can assure you this. If he warned the church at Ephesus that he would remove their candlestick, that he would remove their light, he would remove their gospel witness, and ultimately remove them because the church of Ephesus ceased to be at some point. Do you think he says any less to congregations who don't take seriously? The issue of being stumbling blocks. I say again, the church of Jesus Christ ought to be the safest place on earth for young believers to grow and flourish. And if it's not, something's terribly wrong. And I want us to, I want us to, to embrace this more and more. I thank God. I thank God for the peacemakers who are here. I thank God for those of you who who look at the opportunity to speak 
tender words and kind words and encouraging words into the lives of the little ones who recognize the value of creating the climate that the church is yes on the one hand it is an army the church militant marching against the enemy of our souls driving back the darkness pushing back darkness but it does that with love it does that with kindness it does that with grace it does that with mercy and we need to take seriously Jesus words here today because he means it he means it may we starting with me with you may we recommit to be people whose speech is seasoned with grace like salt holding back the decay preserving preserving the integrity of the gospel the integrity of the ministry the integrity of the church be salt like that to one another and may this increasingly be a place where someone can walk in and connect and not have to wonder am I going to be accepted here do I fit in here do I meet the standards here because we want people to know the standard here is to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor as yourself We are beggars who found bread. And my hope and prayer is that increasingly as, as we encounter those in the way who are starving, we'll say, hey, here's some bread. Here's the bread of life. Changed my life. And when God brings those among us, that they'll recognize that we don't think we're high and mighty. That we want to follow the path of greatness that Jesus has set. And that's to be humble. To be servants. To have regard for the little ones. That we not offend them. That we not harm them. That they can grow up and one day bear testimony. You know, I had the privilege of growing up in a church where the people were so sweet. So obviously loved Jesus. But they preserved me. They kept me from the evil one. That's what Jesus does for us. These are his words, the words of one who hung on a cross for you, who came out of a tomb for you, who gave himself for you. And he says, if you would be identified with me, then do not under any circumstance be a stumbling block to the little ones and do not give yourself occasion where you put your feet on the path to hell let's pray